Good afternoon. Hey, come on, you can do better than that. Good afternoon. Thank you. Welcome. I'm Dean Martha Minow, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you to Harvard Law School. We, of course, meet on Labor Day because we work hard at Harvard Law School. <laughs> at this very moment, we are not actually sitting inside of the law school, but we're instead at the heart of this spectacular university that is our home. So I welcome you also to Harvard University. As we enjoy this space, Know that your life at Harvard Law School is also life inside this great university. So, attend university-wide lectures, courses, events, concerts, theater performances, including some in this very room. It is fitting that we meet here with James Otis, he's the one over there, speaking in 1761 against the British Writs of Assistance, which authorized custom house officers to search any house for smuggled goods. Otis is the one who famously said, taxation without representation is tyranny, remember that? He also though said, and I quote, it is a clear truth that those who every day barter away men's liberty will soon care little for their own. The statue on my left shows Josiah Quincy, outstanding lawyer and advocate for American independence, who nonetheless defended British soldiers in a trial held here after the Boston Massacre. In that incident, British troops killed five civilians after shooting into a crowd. Quincy and future United States President John Adams successfully argued that the soldiers were provoked and hence, at most, guilty of manslaughter. So imagine this, on the brink of the revolution that launched this country, Quincy let, lent his talents both to the political struggle and to the rule of law's respect for individuals. His presence is as good a welcome as you come to study law at Harvard, though I hope our session will be a little bit more lively today. This building is Memorial Hall. It was built to honor Harvard graduates who fought on both sides of the nation's civil war. This room is known for its great acoustics, good for concerts as well as classes. Notice the 180 degree view. You can see me, but more importantly, you can also see one another. And the speakers who have included Winston Churchill, Theodore Roosevelt, Martin Luther King Jr. can see and hear the audience as well. This is a preview of our law school classroom experiences. It is not a spectator sport. Think about what you'll do in class more like learning a musical instrument or a sport than watching a concert or a tournament. And even when you are not the one in the hot seat, you are in the game. W.H. Auden, the poet, once said, a professor is someone who talks in someone else's sleep. You're supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> that is not what law school professors do. Of central importance both in and out of class is interaction with the faculty and with your fellow students. And so I have a question for you today, and it is not rhetorical. That means I will be calling on people. We're going to actually have a conversation. Here's the question, but I promise after your heart has a moment to calm down, I'll let you think about it. Should law include the possibility of forgiveness? Alternatively put, is it inconsistent with the rule of law for individuals, groups, or governments to forgive wrongs? So we're going to talk about it, but I'm going to give you some more context for these questions. Take a criminal charge. Take murder. Take downloading documents in violation of a term of use agreement. Or take a tort a car accident, or a domestic violence assault. Forgiving the wrongdoer contradicts the demand for accountability and the enforcement of norms that the rule of law represents. But forgiving the wrongdoer may also repair social relationships, relieve victims of weighty resentment, permit a fresh start for offenders and for victims both, Specifically, let's focus today on this. Should international law 
direct foreign creditors to forgive debt incurred by a poor nation when its despotic ruler has spent the funds on building statues of himself, on buying arms for a brutal secret police, and on his own personal bank accounts in Switzerland. The despot is now replaced by a populist regime and faces demands for repaid debts by the foreign creditors, both other nations and foreign banks. And there is a rule in international law. And the rule is you have to pay. Pacta sunt servanda. Agreements must be kept. But not a few people have been calling for exceptions to this rule. In the specific context that I have described, excuse a nation from having to repay debts undertaken by a prior regime, contrary to the interests of the society. Collected under the name odious debt, what a name, odious debt, is the claim it's just an idea that international law should not enforce sovereign debts undertaken for purposes at odds with the interests of the people who are asked to repay them. In international law, there is no government that's empowered to bind. There is no rule of bankruptcy. To create international norms, we look to endorsement by nations, sufficiently wide enough to call the practice accepted or consensus. We also look to support from scholars. And guess what, guys? That means us. So I'm going to ask you for real three related questions. Should international institutions and countries recognize a doctrine of odious debt, excusing non-payment in the circumstances I've described? Question two, if so, when? Under what circumstances? When the government incurring the debt is oppressive, when it doesn't act in the interests of the people more broadly, when the creditor knows all of that, when is the knowledge? That's the second. Under what circumstances? And the third, how would this work? Would the debtor nation itself declare? Would the creditors need to make an assessment that a debt is odious? Should there be a new international body created to identify what is an odious debt? OK, I'm going to call on people. But first, I'm going to let you talk to each other about it. So turn to your neighbor and discuss. When I summon you back, we'll talk about it together. This is a clue to the value of talking with your colleagues, but I am going to start calling on people. So, fickle finger of fate. I'm going to call on you. Yes? It was. Uh, we had some really good conversation, and Stephen had his first initial reaction was that there should be a process for. Um, countries to claim some odious debt provision and receive some type of forgiveness. What we talked about was maybe there's not 100% forgiveness, but some type of adjustment uh, to the repayment plan. And there needs to be clear guidelines as to the threshold or, or you know, um, what they need to show to, to qualify for odious debt. What did the previous regime need to have done with the money um, to you know, qualify for this new benefit? So that requirement of some specificity would be necessary whether the forgiveness is partial or complete. So I'm not sure what difference it makes to call it partial or complete. You still would need that. And I'm not sure how you would specify what part and what not part. So let's focus on those conditions. Um, but I also look, hand the mic to the person below you. <laughs> so should odious debt be recognized, and if so, why? 
Yes, we discussed that it should be, um, especially if the current regime is working towards progress in the realms of either human rights or just overall better governance of their citizens. Um, why wouldn't you respect um, that change and that, that progress? And there's some kind of unfairness in continuing to punish the people for something they didn't do when they're making a difference. But how do we measure progress? We've all seen nations that claim to make a transition and a year later it's just another oppressive regime. So uh, how much time should be allowed? How do we measure that kind of progress? Any thoughts? I know the discussion, or it came up earlier, um, so if, if does the regime have to be completely democratic before their debt is forgiven? And we said no, that if you can show, I'm not sure if there's, I mean, I know I studied in political science, there are formulas that scholars have come up with to show progress in mm -hmm. democracies, but I mean, you could use that formula from a scholar, right. or if there's just even some type of variance in democratic Great. Um, Great. characteristics, then that's even a little progress is progress. Great. All right. Uh, I want to call on somebody over here. Uh, you, red shirt. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Should the doctrine of odious debt be uh, recognized, and if so, why, and if not, why not? Um, yes, uh, it, the doctrine should be recognized. Um, we said because it would be unfair to continue to punish those people uh, for the unjust uh, expenditure of money by the uh, government, and we discussed the possibility of creating some sort of uh, international group that would adjudicate whether or not countries were meeting adequate progress, the downside of which would be that countries may be hesitant to want to lend if they knew that they were giving up sovereignty uh, over their ability to collect that debt to an international group. Um, but at the end of the day, that seemed to be a more just way of conducting the business than, uh, than just giving, than saying that countries had every right to collect every debt. Great, so, so two ideas there. One, that there is some sense of fairness involved, even recognizing the negative consequences that it may dry up loans, may dry up loans to poor countries, may dry up loans to poor countries that actually really need the money and second idea is that there could be an international body that could recognize which of these debts ought to be forgiven, that either using those kinds of measures of progress towards democracy or some kind of assessment of how bad was the prior regime. I'd like somebody who thinks, no, there should not be a recognized doctrine. Yes, wait for the mic, thanks. In class, you won't have to wait for the mic. That'll be good. So a little nuance to my argument. I say no because on the commercial side, right? If, if you tell a bank, loan money to Nigeria or Benin, and this can be forgiven at any moment, you're gonna increase the interest rates and other countries are gonna be punished unfairly. Right. And I think you already have systems in place to take care of this, and this can be taken care of on a sovereign bilateral level. So Ghana, where I grew up, was a high, became a highly indebted poor country initiative. It, because of you know, democratic credentials, they qualified for the Millennium Challenge account. You already have ways in the bilateral and multilateral international systems to solve for that. You start imposing these ideas that sound good, but what's going to happen now is, instead of being able to borrow at six to seven percent because of risk adjustments in the markets, mm -hmm. suddenly the premium is going to be 15 percent. And then the remaining 54, you know, one state in Africa might wonder, but the 54 states who are doing well will then have to suffer. So I think we have to be very right. careful about what could sound like a good idea but would have unintended consequences. So great, great uh, details and also uh, uh, knowledge about what's happened with Ghana and other countries. But let's just push this point about interest rate more seriously. So the interest rate goes up because the creditors are trying to deal with greater risk. That's a rational market response. 
Maybe it even goes up so high that certain countries say it's not worth it, we can't afford it. Or it goes up so seriously that creditors say, we're simply not going to lend. Is there anything good that happens from that? I understand the bad. You've told me the bad. But does anything good happen from that? Who wants to answer that? Anything good from the creditors' resources drying up to allegedly odious regimes? We have a hand up over here. Volunteers are welcome. Mike, yeah. Uh, here's. Raise your hand high. Thank you. Um, well, we thought it might be a good thing because it could create an incentive to creditors to um, exercise a little bit more discretion in who they're lending to. Um, and so if they know that this regime is using the money to buy statutes or statues mm -hmm. or like going into personal accounts, they know that the money is mismanaged, um, then they decide not to lend to those countries and focus their lending on countries that are doing um, more not human rights violations. Right. So, so while there's a, sh a short-term, long-term problem here, right? Short-term could be very onerous for countries that are very desperate. Long-term, maybe it would use the international capital markets to put pressure on regimes that mistreat their people. And maybe that's a good thing. I'm not judging it. I just want you to think through the consequences. Other negatives, other negatives about recognizing this doctrine. I see a hand over here. Yes. Hold on for the mic. It's coming your way. Hold that thought. Raise your hand up. And if, balcony, you're next. If the people think they've got to pay back an odious debt, it might create an incentive for them to depose the tyrant. To propose, I'm sorry? To depose the tyrant. I see. OK. Or so, to disagree with his policies. Right. And then what might be good and positive consequences from that? Well, people who might be complicit in the spending on statues and bank accounts might say, if we have to pay this back, it's, less, it's more of a problem. We should worry about it and attack him. So you build a bigger coalition to be monitoring the behavior of the tyrant. Right. But what if they're unable to do it? Previously, they have no incentive. Under the odious debt doctrine, at least now they have incentive, it seems to me, to be better than nothing. All right. Balcony, I want to hear an argument for recognizing. And we have a hand even. Boy, the rest of you are off the hook. <laughs> Briefly. The thing we talked about, oh, there we go, um, was the phrase for the good of the people or not in the interest of the people has a lot of gray area to it. And so take this country, for example. What if you had Republicans saying, that uh, welfare programs or contraception programs were not in the interest of the people because of this argument, or Democrats saying that defense spending was unnecessary and not in the interest of the people. And somehow this country, you know, goes downhill a bit and we've got, you know, a lot of debt to another nation. And, and then we say, somebody in, in this country makes the argument, well, this debt, we're not going to pay because those programs were not in the interest of the people. They were in the interest of a select few. And that creates, I mean, that's an extreme example, but that kind of situation where the interest of the people is not as clear cut as, say, a statue of the tyrant creates a situation where you could get into a lot of semantics about what is or isn't a valid debt Great. and people sort of abusing that system. Great. So it, you might try to have a bright line between regimes that are democratically organized versus not. So although there might be some people who don't like the policies, there's the capacity within the government to be able to overturn those policies. But even then, we have troubles really specifying what really is a democracy and what's not. Um, I'm sorry. If it's the creditor nation versus the debtor nation, right. you've got sort of issues there with different standards of judgment being applied to the same problem. We've had some very good discussions so far about whether to have such a doctrine and also under what circumstances. Not so much, except one brief comment about if we were to have such a doctrine, how would it be implemented? One suggestion is create an international body. Uh, would that be an existing body? Would it be a new body? Is there anything besides create a new international body that you could imagine could develop a reputation for fairness and precision in implementing this doctrine. Any other way? Maybe use the bilateral contract negotiation agreement. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work, but maybe the debtor nation now under new rule renegotiates the terms of the debt with the creditor. 
Uh, there certainly are some structures for doing that already. Anything else besides those two? Hand over here. Raise your hand up. Good. Well, as a starting point, you could use something like the International Criminal Court as like a very, at least like the lowest bar. So if someone's convicted as a war criminal and was in charge of the country when they were committing those crimes, then that's, it's probable that they were using the money not in the interests of the people. Um, so that could be just a beginning as a way to like set a very low standard for what counts as odious debt. So you could try to peg it to some uh, existing institutions. Little problem, the International Criminal Court seems to take about eight to 10 years to do any prosecutions, but um, the interest would be accumulating during that time. I, maybe there's an escrow account. We could have a lot of fun with that. Um, okay, I'm gonna take two more comments. And then I'm going to ask for a show of hands about whether we should recognize this doctrine or not. Here's a hand over here. We already have international bodies that do a lot of the lending. The IMF and the World Bank lend the majority of the funds that go to so, poor countries. So it seems to make sense that that's where we would start, at least, in terms of creating an international council. Um, and they also, we do a lot of this already. We, we set up structural adjustment loans. We already set up terms upon which uh, loans are given that create changes in government. So it makes sense that, you know, we've already gone a few steps down this road um, if governments don't fulfill the terms of those loans, uh, then we could go a couple more steps to thinking about how right. to forgive them. Great, and there's some real expertise there to build on, but hold on to the mic because I have a question for you. Sorry. What if the standards ratchet up at the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the existing institutions that reflect the consensus view of democracies. And as a result, certain countries are targeted for ineligibility for international debt. And there are a few other countries that step up and say, oh, then we'll loan to them. We become the odious creditors in support of odious debtors. What, if anything, does that do to the suggestion that we should rely on the institutions right now that are the chief lenders in this business? Let me make sure I understand your question. So the, uh, what if the IMF and the World Bank say that they're not going to lend to certain countries, but then Correct. other countries just make bilateral loans to these countries? Correct. And then what is the issue? What is the potential well, the issue Well, the issue with that? then is, is that going to have more negative consequences? Does it, it ultimately end up reducing the influence of the IMF and the World Bank, ultimately altering the entire balance of power in the international markets, and ultimately creating a we-they world of odious debtors and creditors on one side and people on the other? I think it does, but I think that tyrants don't repay their debts. So I think that the, the market has can make its own adjustments in those cases. Very nice response, but maybe there's some things going on here besides money. And maybe the reason why countries might be interested, some countries becoming odious creditors, is not about getting the money back. Hmm. Maybe it's about having political influence um, yeah. or other kinds of influence by securing the uh, assent of those, uh, those countries in their um, invasion of other countries or other kinds of activities. So the point here is, this is the kind of problem you're going to spend time on here, where it's important to understand economics, institutions, consequences, moral argument. This problem cannot be resolved simply by knowing what, pr what happens right now in international finance. And this problem cannot be resolved simply by knowing moral theory. You actually need both of those. And you also need to learn about the design of different kinds of institutions, what has been done, what could be done. And you also need to know how to counter arguments that other people make. The c discussion that we're having here is genuinely the kind of discussion that alters the shape of international law. Because as I've said to you, international law develops by conversation and consensus and practice. And just out of curiosity, let me see now, based on this discussion, show of hands, how many people favor the development of a doctrine of odious debt? And how many people oppose it? And how many people did not vote? <laughs> okay. 
It was a slight majority in favor, but I think it, you actually capture pretty well the degree of argument that's going on in the world on this exact question. This is a great conversation. I'm just going to review some of the things that you raised. Considerations against recognition of a doctrine of odious debt include that forgiveness will probably encourage more bad behavior. Some people call that moral hazard. Or there might be conditions imposed that require subjective judgment. That was an important point, and the subjective judgment might lead to internal disputes as well as a lot of chaos. Or there might be the odious creditor who emerges. Something we didn't talk about but I think is worth thinking about as a negative is that there could be subterfuge to evade the doctrine. So, for example, several governments have given the Congo bridge loans to repay the International Monetary Fund and extended new credit to the Congo to repay um, and uh, totally ignoring the International Monetary Fund's own efforts to, p to set limits on money to the Congo. So financing through grants and other funds may actually bypass the doctrine itself. There are issues about whether or not creating this doctrine would end up undermining the respect for the existing international law because it would be either bypassed or it would produce chaos in the, cre in the international credit markets. In favor, I thought there were some pretty good arguments about just fundamental fairness. Behavior that hurts people should not be approved. One way that lawyers talk about that is unjust enrich enrichment. Why should the creditors be able to re re secure returns on the basis of transactions that they know unjustly enrich them at the expense of ordinary people? And we also talked about the possibility of creating disincentives for lenders to undertake giving bad loans. One thing I should tell you is that there is some evidence of debt repudiation being recognized, being asserted in international practice, even if it's not a legal doctrine right now. And this it goes back to incidents like the Soviet repudiation of Tsarist debt in 1917. A famous case, Costa Rica refused to honor debts incurred around the same time under a leader named Federico Tinoco. It produced an international crisis that led to an arbitration presided over by the sitting justice, Chief Justice of the United States, William Taft, who had been the President of the United States. And he, in a classic splitting the baby arbitration decision, decided that the Tinoco regime was legitimate and therefore the debt should be repaid. On the other hand, they were used for bad purposes, therefore they should not. <laughs> After the toppling of Saddam Hussein, Iraqi economists and lawyers called for forgiving odious debt, using that term. And that led to 31 members of the United States Congress, 100 members of British Parliament, and others around the world joining in and saying, yes, we should recognize this doctrine of odious debt. In 2006, Norway unconditionally, unilaterally, on its own, canceled about $80 million uh, due on payments owed to, uh, to it by several countries based on Norway's own assessment that the debts were not legitimate because they did not serve the needs of the people. So there's something happening in this area. And as I've said, you know, it's not because there is a doctrine of bankruptcy in international law. There's nothing like that. And that's interesting to think about because Inside of domestic nations, businesses often declare bankruptcy as a business strategy. In this country, it's sometimes used as a way to break union contracts or a way to prioritize relationships or to walk away from investments that make no sense. Bankruptcy for individuals still often carries shame, less so for companies. And taking a page from commercial debt collection companies that purchase bad debt and collect pennies on the dollar, it's their business model. If we get a few of these repaid, we will actually make money because we've spent so little in buying this debt. They do so by garnishing wages, harassing debtors. This practice, well known, has actually been followed recently by supporters of Occupy Wall Street, which started an organization called Rolling Jubilee to purchase consumer debt and then forgive it. 
Having raised more than half a million dollars as of last week, this effort allowed the purchase of $10 million worth of consumer debt, chiefly people's medical bills, student loans, and then forgave it, called compassion debt. This is an example of a private market approach using the same kind of rationales that supporters of odious debt have argued for. Now, whether to forgive in some ways is a question marking the boundary between law and morals, but it's also a question that recurs within law over and over. I'm just going to list a couple of the pressing areas where forgiveness is currently a hot topic. Should people who borrow too much to buy a home and then watch the value of the home decline be forgiven? Should the lenders be forgiven for taking shortcuts in the paperwork in giving those home loans when they now seek to foreclose on mortgages produced with robo-signing? That is the robotic process of mass production of forged execution of legal documents. A little closer to home, should student loans be forgiven? The United States bankruptcy law doesn't think so. Harvard Law School forgives loans for those who pursue public interest jobs. Should polluters be forgiven? A prominent example arises from the 2010 BP oil spill disaster, the largest ever accidental marine spill when the oil rig leased by that company exploded in the Gulf of Mexico and spewed millions of barrels of oil into the ocean. The apology by the CEO of the company has been followed by $42.2 billion paid in civil and criminal settlements and an ongoing fund to pay for damages. But the company has also gone to court seeking to suspend the fund. And last week, a court said, no, you can't suspend it. The company says we should be able to suspend it because in fact, there's a lot of fraud. People going to get payment from us because they think we're just an open bank. But there's fraud going on. At what point should this be over? Should they be forgiven? Should government lawyers be forgiven for giving professional opinions, say, on what is torture that may turn out to be wrong or faulty? Should central bankers, aware of the ma manipulation of the LIBOR rate, the average interest rate calculated through submissions of interest by major banks in London, should they be forgiven? Should the forgiveness on the part of a victim or a victim's family affect a decision whether or not to prosecute or whether or not to sentence someone charged with rape or someone charged with murder? Some murder victims' families in various parts of the world have formed associations to seek reconciliation, and in those countries that have the death penalty, to oppose the death penalty, making poignant representations in individual cases. In some legal systems, repentance by offenders and forgiveness by victims play pivotal roles in criminal justice generally, and this option is now debated in countries that don't have that as a regime. District attorneys and prosecutors in many parts of this country now convening restitution circles, discussion for restorative justice. Should violations of international human rights that give rise to criminal prosecutions, like at the International Criminal Court, should they instead give rise to truth and reconciliation commissions? South Africa engaged in one that has now triggered similar efforts in some 50 jurisdictions. In South Africa, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission actually provided amnesty for participants in the apartheid regime and also for freedom fighters. They could avoid prosecution in exchange for truthful testimony. And now there's a current question. In those countries that have used this kind of device, a truth commission, does that then remove power in the international community to have criminal prosecution? Does it substitute for criminal prosecution? Or the technical question before the International Criminal Court right now is whether or not 
those domestic alternatives to criminal prosecution actually deprive the International Criminal Court of jurisdiction because of complementarity, because they've engaged in a complementary regime. A more mundane but persistent question is whether courts, opponents, agencies, law professors, should forgive someone who misses a deadline. You don't have to tell me if you've ever asked for an extension. I know you have. Should I forgive some of you for being late today? No comment. <laughs> Whether to pursue forgiveness, mercy, excuse, or pragmatic decisions just to move on, engage lawyers across many fields. And what we argue for in law is not just academic. It changes what happens in the world. It changes what people hope for. It changes what people do. Rules help guide behavior, but rules can also have exceptions. The gift of the rule of law is the chance for predictability and security, making us free from whim and arbitrariness because we can conform our conduct to those rules. That makes it troubling to create exceptions. There's a lot in jeopardy. What place, then, if any, should there be for release from the strictures of law in the name of forgiveness? Or can we build rules around forgiveness so it, too, is predictable? This is the subject of my own current research, and I'm going to be shameless here in inviting you to be in touch with me in person, by email, with your thoughts on the topic, and volunteers for research assistance, most welcome. It is the great privilege of my life to have the chance to talk and learn with the extraordinary students of Harvard Law School. You have begun to have a sense of this. Now you've begun to talk with one another, and let's turn to who are your fellow students. We have an amazing faculty and staff, but truly, the greatness of the school is the students, past and future. We have here today Students coming for master and doctoral degrees are LLM and SJD students. We have students transferring into the JD program. We have exchange students from our partner schools around the world. And we have students starting their first study of law in our JD program. And let me tell you a little bit about yourselves and those around you. LLM and SJD students, please raise your hands. Okay, lots in the balcony, I see. <laughs> you are a tremendous group, and you are going to have enormous fun. We have 181 LLM students this year admitted from over 1,600 applications, and together you represent 67 jurisdictions from Argentina to Vietnam, and a majority of you are women. You are judges and prosecutors, defense attorneys, LGBT activists, professors, Clerks who have served on high courts from Colombia, India, Puerto Rico, Israel. 58 of you have advanced degrees. Most of you have worked for two or more years. 20 of you have been Fulbright scholars. We have a former professional soccer player, a police officer, a pharmacist, a film producer, a radio TV host, a patent holder, and an opera singer. Two among you are active Navy JAG officers, and we are so delighted you're here, and I thank you for your service to this country. All of you in the... <laughs> All of you in the graduate program will become an amazing community and resource for one another and for the entire law school community. Faculty and students will learn from your tremendous work experiences at the United Nations Mechanism for International Criminal Trials, at the Ministry for Mining in Chile, the Department of Treaty and Law for China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Constant Constitutional Review Commission of Ghana, Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of Mexico, the Mexican Minister of Communications and Transportation, Liberia's Rule of Law Initiative, Turkey's Competition Authority, Uganda's Human Rights Network, and Georgia's Criminal Justice Reform, you know, just when you bump into someone at lunch, like, just say, what'd you do last year? 
We are thrilled to welcome the LLM class of 2013. We also welcome 14 new doctoral candidates joining over 45 already in the program while on their way to earning their doctorates in law. You all bring deep learning, energy, and experience. At places like the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the National Assembly of Ecuador, the Gender Equality Office of Mexico's Supreme Court of Justice, and all of these SJD students to a person are wonderful, talented, engaging, and we wish you all good fortune, good reading and writing as you embark on your doctoral studies. Now, graduates of the LLM and SJD program include distinguished leaders in business, government, architects of legal systems, and accomplished scholars, and I can't help but brag about at least a few of them. Radhika Kumar Verswamy hails from uh, Sri Lanka. She just stepped down as Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Special Representative for Children in Armed Conflict. She graduated from here in 1982. She's also served as chairperson of the Sri Lankan Human Rights Commission and the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women. Mike Klein worked after his LLM degree as a corporate lawyer and then as a businessman and organizer of nonprofit ventures. He now is the president of Penn Faulkner Foundation, which makes annual awards for fiction writing, and he founded the Sunlight Project to fight corruption in the United States Congress. Sam Pisar, a Holocaust survivor, received his first law degree in Australia, studied for and received his doctorate here, and then went to work for the United Nations, for the United States President, and then moved to France, where he became one of the leading trade lawyers in the world, honored with the commandeer of the French Legion of Honor. Daniel Lipsic, who has served as the Interior Minister and Minister of the Justice of Slovakia. Sandile Nkobo, who served as Chief Justice of South Africa's Constitutional Court and last year served as a visiting faculty member here. Another group of students who are here are transfer students, extremely strong, 34 students coming from 21 schools with an enormous number of applicants. You are the ones we chose. Raise your hands if you're a transfer student. Nobody here is a transfer student. Okay, there are 34 of them. Everyone look for them. Okay. And you two are terrific, and you have worked for Teach for America, AmeriCorps, in Congress. There are three certified accountants, and we're going to look for them in <laughs> April. There's a military captain who served in Iraq. There's a military captain who served in Afghanistan. The transfer students speak 11 languages, but let's confess, one person is responsible for six of them. And uh, the transfer students play bass, guitar, electric violin, harmonica, piano, and guitar. We picked you to be a group. <laughs> There's a Division I track star, a Marine Corps marathon five-time finisher, an Ironman and canoe racer, a freestyle skier, a licensed skydiver, some great golfers, and a hula dancer. I think there's a lot of energy in this group. I am so glad also to see so many entrepreneurs and public service-oriented people. Recent graduates who came here as transfer students include Julie Kobrick, who just finished her clerkship with uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg at the United States Supreme Court, Dan Lawson, who runs the Civil Rights Project at University of California, Los Angeles, and Caleb Weaver, who is now the press secretary for the United States Department of Agriculture. Among us are members of the entering JD class. Raise your hands. <laughs> there are 562 of you from 171 colleges and universities, from 12 countries, from 42 of the United States, plus the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Given the 5,510 students who applied, which was more than the last year, you guys really impressed us. And once again, I congratulate all of you. Nearly half of you are women, 41% are students of color, 11% of you have advanced degrees, 27% came straight from college. That means, if your math is any good, 73% of you did not. <laughs> Which means that the vast majority of you have been working or done graduate study. 11% of you are not United States citizens. And among you are Rhodes and Fulbright scholars, Teach for America alumni. You speak many, many languages. 
Some of you have military service, and that includes active service and veterans, and again, let me personally thank you for your service. The class of 2016 includes 17 AmeriCorps and nine Peace Corps alumni, marathon runners and coaches, marathon political campaigners, and marching to a different drum, a rock band drummer, a reality game show winner, and a veteran of running with the bulls. Well prepared for law school. <laughs> you are entrepreneurs. You have founded charter schools and ed tech global network, companies for web and data design and for food technology and tutoring, a multi-purpose entertainment site, organizations to assist African development, organizations to assist students in Detroit, and an organization to advance nonfiction writing. You've worked around the world for governments in law offices, banks, retailers, consulting firms, think tanks, nonprofit organizations. Among you is an assistant movie producer, a corp many corporate finance analysts, teachers of third grade, high school math, taekwondo, college English, pre-K literacy, an instrument repair technician, criminal justice investigators, the master of ceremonies of the Cathedral of Mary, our Queen. Nonprofit organization uh, participants, uh, you've dealt with hunger, healthcare, economic freedom, ethical treatment of animals. There is an LA Times reporter, a Starbucks barista, a master bread maker. And our JD students with military experiences come from all branches of the United States Armed Services the Air Force, the Army, the Coast Guard, the Marine Corps, the Navy, and at least one member of the armed services of another democracy. You have worked for the United States Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, the Federal Reserve Board, the Massachusetts State House, the permanent mission of Afghanistan to the United States, the United Nations Environmental Program, Interpol, the United States Census Bureau, the Department of Education, the United States Department of State, the United States Department of Justice, the United States Department of Treasury, and the White House, the German Marshall Fund of the United States, Habitat for Humanity, Project Vote Smart, the American Civil Liberties Union, the Kansas Bar Association, Legal Aid Society, the Vera Institute for Criminal Justice, the Supreme Court, I guess I mentioned that one already, some of you have worked around the world in places like the Association for the Development of Pakistan, the Austrian Federal Ministry for Education, the Canadian Center for Responsibility to Protect, Canada's, uh, I'm sorry, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the Embassy of the Republic of Korea, the French Senate, the European uh, Delegation to the United States, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ethiopia, NATO, Republic of Korea, Ministry of National Defense, Bain and Company, Barclays, Boston Consulting Group, Capital One Financial Corporation, Citigroup, Edelman, Goldman Sachs, Kusher Companies, JP Morgan, Liberty Mutual, MasterCard Worldwide, Morgan Stanley, and Google. And you can all meet here without violating the antitrust laws. You've worked for the ABC News and Facebook, Fox Broadcast Company, Fox News Channel, the FX Network, Hearst, Imaginations, Los Angeles Times, Public Broadcasting Service, The New Yorker Magazine, NPR, Wayne Scott Media, The Washington Post, Universal Music Group, Motown Records, Vogue China, Vogue Nippon, and Walt Disney Company. And you keep busy even when you're not working or studying. You dance. There are two belly dancers, four hip hop dancers, six ballet dancers, and at least one ballroom dance instructor. And in addition to a cappella and four opera singers, the JD class plays baritone horn, bass, cello, clarinet, drums, electric bass, electric guitar, euphonium, flute, French horn, guitar, harp, piano, saxophone, trombone, trumpet, vi viola, and violin. And one drummer was in a rock band that turned internationally and released eight records. We have a music society. I think you could go far here. We have actors, directors, playwrights, a production manager, a lighting designer, a filmmaker, and three-time MTV reality competition winner. A licensed Alaska fishing guide, a park ranger, an Eagle Scout, a, pi a private pilot, a yoga teacher, and a member of the board of directors of the International Quidditch Association.
I'm most uh, amazed by the variety of volunteer work you have done, ranging from groups like Best Buddies that assist people with disabilities and the Special Olympics, uh, the Catholic AIDS uh, Action Organization, Meals on Wheels, remarkable. What happens to our JD students after HLS? Tiny sample. 1986 graduate Paul Capuccio, I saw this summer. He's executive vice, vice president and general counsel of Time Warner, the media conglomerate. He determines what we all see. Victoria Dorfman, who works at a law firm where she's now argued, I think, in half of the circuit courts in the United States, and she successfully represented Congressman Boehner when he claimed a violation of the federal eavesdropping, anti-eavesdropping statute. U.S. Brigadier General David Brahms, who became director of the Judge Advocate Corps of the United States Marine Corps. And now in private practice, he serves on the board of the Judge Advocates Association and has been a technical assistant to Hollywood films, including a few good men. Justice Wilhelmina Wright was appointed last year to the Minnesota Supreme Court after service as an appellate judge and a trial judge and a district attorney and being lawyer for school districts. Lloyd Blankfein, who is the chair and CEO of the multinational investment banking firm Goldman Sachs. Samantha Power, confirmed last month uh, as a United States ambassador to the United uh, Nations. She began a paper under my supervision. She got the Pulitzer Prize for the book, of that, which that was the first chapter. I did not get the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> Justice Elena Kagan, serving now in the United States Supreme Court, she and I invite you to join us tomorrow for a Q&A on campus. So we also have here the chance to applaud the class of 2000 and... Now there's one more group that I want to recognize among the students, and that is a group of 16 exchange students from law schools and universities around the world. We have partner institutions around the world, uh, many with formal relationships. We've had uh, Harvard Law students go study in about 28 institutions around the world. I'm struck by how global you all are. And I, again, suggest that you all take the time to go up to someone you don't recognize and just say, who are you? <laughs> and tell me about yourself. Um, I'm so delighted to welcome our exchange students here. Past and present, we have just unbelievable students. Yes, the Chief Justice and five other Justices of the United States Supreme Court. Yes, the First Lady and the President of the United States. And yes, the opposing candidate for the United States presidency last year. Many senators and Senate candidates in the, this country. Also the recent President of the World Bank, the newest Justice on Australia's High Court, the President of the Republic of China, CEOs of major companies, managing partners, the Prime Minister of the Tibetan exile government, directors of foundations, creators and leaders of local and global nonprofits. These are not bragging points. Well, okay, they're not just bragging points. <laughs> These are reminders of what you can do with the help of this institution and the friends and connections and relationships and knowledge you will build here. It's also a reminder of the responsibilities that we have in the work that we do. You will wield power. You can do more good alone and together than any other group of law students anywhere in the world. In light of all that you have heard, I forgive you if you are experiencing a wave of what I guess I would call imposter syndrome. Like, how did I get here exactly? <laughs> and I will tell you, we searched the world for you. We picked each one of you because you dazzle us. You are talented. You are passionate. You are maybe a little driven. You each make lives of meaning and accomplishment. We picked you because you have the gifts to pursue your dreams and because your dreams can change the world. The only thing that would be unforgivable 
is if you do not take full advantage of the opportunities before you. And that means truly immersing. That means volunteering, taking risks, getting to know your classmates, your faculty. You won't just be getting degrees here or course credit. You will be earning your future. You will work hard, but it should be hard. You'll work to analyze complex social and legal problems. You'll be debating concrete problems and cases. And I think you'll see why we have the reputation for caring so much about teaching and the learning experience. We are famous here for the case method. Dean Christopher Columbus Langdell started a method of teaching law through Socratic questions, discussing the reports of actual cases. The reasoning produced by judges in hard cases offers the chance to link principles to facts, to reconstruct and critique prior judgments, to examine how legal rules are embodied and tested in specific instances, and you will apply principles and rules to new problems and well beyond the judicial context, you will exercise your capacity for devising alternative solutions. You will consider the consequences of each path. Parodies of the Socratic method provide moments of high drama in movies like The Paper Chase and Legally Blonde. Now, you've heard it here from me. When you are called on in class and you do not know what to say, a good answer is, it depends. <laughs> and then, try to speculate upon what does it depend. <laughs> what more do you need to know? What are you assuming? What are the counter views? What would somebody say in response? What's the effect of what you argue? You will generate multiple characterizations of any given problem. You'll identify multiple solutions. You'll identify unintended consequences, as we did in discussing odious debt. And you will defend decisions. You will debate. And you'll think again. You'll develop and stretch what my colleague, Todd Rakoff, calls legal imagination. And for this, and for 100 opportunities, 1 million opportunities for pro bono clinical research, you will have superb experiences here. My advice is dive in. But I do have three specific assignments for you before we leave here today. I'm a teacher. I get to call on people and give assignments. First, make sure you find at least one professor this year to get to know, who gets to know you. Invite your professors for lunch or coffee. Stay after class. Volunteer in class. Ask them what they're working on. You have better social skills than they do. <laughs> Second assignment, get to know and learn with one another. Form study groups, but also talk informally. Don't stop talking when class ends. Don't stop taking notes when someone in class speaks instead of the professor. Make great and lifelong friends. When I meet with alumni at their 50th reunions here, they talk about the friendships that they have made and kept for all those years. At the end of this month, we're going to have Celebration 60 honoring the admission of women to Harvard Law School. And we're going to have graduates through all these years. And in planning this event, I can tell you the friendships that I've encountered across the years, the, the classes, people who didn't even know each other while they were in law school and had become great friends afterwards. It's simply remarkable. Alumni all remember the beginning of their time at Harvard Law School. Sometimes it may seem overwhelming. We know it can be a challenge to navigate the legal structure when you're still learning where the rooms are. Crucially, we know that the legal system is not just existing. It's actually building blocks that help us order and reorder and build new structures and design new systems. 
We are eager for your ideas, your ways of framing issues and solving problems. When you leave here, you will work in a world that you inherit, but you will also invent the world in which you will live. As I end this welcome, here is your third assignment. Do not leave this room without introducing yourself to two other people that you haven't yet met. And come with them to the reception. And when I meet you, introduce me to someone that you have just met. You have come here to make a difference. You have already started to make Harvard Law School different. I thank you. And once more, I say welcome to Harvard Law School. <laughs>